Well, thank you very much uh, and for having me and having me host this, uh, this opening session on the second day. Uh, it's indeed my pleasure to be here and having come to this conference uh, for the last, um, I don't know, four or five years. Um, it's amazing the, 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 the quality of the speakers, the quality of the topics, and how I spent the day yesterday at the Kennedy School and some of the discussions, et cetera, were fascinating. So it's really my, my deep pleasure to be helping moderate this session this morning um, with, uh, with, with Kesha Murugesh. Um, so without much ado, let me introduce him and then we can take the conversation from there. The focus today's discussion is really about uh, the decade, if you will, um, and how the role that India can play in, in the decade in terms of developing it and really building on, on the Dean's comments about the importance of economic growth in India but at the same time, a really big, big focus on inclusive growth, not just growth for the sake of growth, but inclusive growth given the diversity and, and the massive uh, population that India has and the role that it can actually play in, in changing some important societal issues. So with that, uh, with, without much ado, um, let me uh, introduce uh, Keshav Murugesh. So uh, welcome Keshav, we are here at the uh, Klarman Hall at Harvard Business School. Um, and um, so to introduce Keshav, Keshav is the group, and I'm going to read this because it's a seriously impressive resume. I don't want to mess it up. Um, is the group CEO of New York Stock List, is new NYSE listed WNS Holdings, a global leader in accelerating the transformation of global companies by leveraging people, process, and digital innovation. He's a past chairman of NASCOM and prior to that has served as chairperson of NASCOM's BPM Council for two years. He's also coached chief mentor of Kalpatru Center of Entrepreneurship, established under the guidance of Software Technology Parks of India to promote innovation and entrepreneurship. He's an angel investor in tech-oriented startups and has spoken to the World Economic Forum, Harvard, like he is today, and many other universities. He has received a number of awards from the ICAI, CNBC, Economic Times, and Anactus, an organization he brought to India and chaired for six terms. Keshav loves all sports, and we'd love to talk to you about that because I think that's really an important part of India, but is partial to cricket, surprise, surprise, <laughs> uh, and football. <laughs> so anyway, with, uh, without much ado, uh, welcome Keshav. Thank you so much for, uh, for participating and for all of WNS's support and making this, uh, this conference happen. So maybe I'll hand it over to you for some opening remarks on your perspective on India's role in the decade, India's role in digital transformation, and what you see broadly as the opportunities and challenges, and then we can take it from there. So over to you. Thank you, Thank Professor. You. Uh, and a really a great morning to everyone uh, you know, over there. First of all, I must thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak on a subject that infuses tremendous pride, optimism, and of course, hope, you know, for me both as an you know, Indian business leader, and of course, a citizen of India. So Morgan Stanley actually predicts that India will be one of three economies in the world that will generate over $400 billion in annual economic output growth from 2023 onward. And this is going to rise to more than $500 billion after 2028. Now, with a 5.5% average GDP growth over the past decade, India has uh, rightly, I would say, claimed the, the crown of being the fastest growing uh, economy in the world today. India, I believe, is also on the track to become the world's third largest economy by 2027 and have the third largest stock market by 2030, following all its key investments in uh, technology as well as energy. Now, this decade is without a doubt, as you put it, a decade with technology being our great accelerator. Specifically, if you look at 2022, it has been an absolute breakthrough year for the Indian technology industry which now has emerged as an absolute technology hotbed. 
30 to 32 percent of revenues came from you know the digital stream the software products segment has also witnessed tremendous growth it has now clocked 13.4 billion dollars in 2022 and is expected to touch 30 to 40 billion dollars by 2030 so what we were referring to a few years ago as technology potential from an India perspective has already made that big leap uh, to technology impact, I would say. And the best part of this impact is that it has become central to life as well as business. It is solving you know, real problems in the lives of people. Now, all of us who have used the digital stack know what I'm talking about. But I'll give you a few other examples. You know, the Indian uh, health tech startup, Blue Semi, which some of you may have heard of, has designed a very innovative and sleek healthcare product called Iva. And this is patented by, uh, you know, it's powered by patented technology that is leveraging today uh, sensor fusion, artificial intelligence as well as IoT, and IVA can now measure six vitals in 60 seconds with just a touch of the skin. Now with amazing accuracy, it can also provide effective guidelines to bring down sugar levels as well as blood pressure. So imagine the impact it can have. In agriculture, an AI-based chatbot now developed by Digital Green as well as Colored Cow provides farmers with customized notifications and short videos on a real-time basis. Now, this is helping farmers to plan and manage crops much more efficiently. So I would say that tech today, technology is also quite social and fun as well. You probably are aware that India's first blockchain wedding happened in November 2021. When a Pune-based couple's marriage was made official with an Ethereum smart contract. So India is, you know, certainly shaping and leading this decade, you know, for the world. And I must say it was really a proud moment when our honorable union finance minister was speaking at an event re recently at you know, Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies. She offered the service of the India stack which is our open source network for digital public goods, as well as APIs to other countries that need such expertise. Now, India's indigenously developed and full-fledged, you know, 5G infrastructure is also ready for sharing with other nations. It includes core, uh, as well as radio network components. And according to the Indian DOT, they could be commercially available as soon as March 23. That's next month. This can propel you know, India to an elite club of telecom network technology players from the US, Sweden, Finland, South Korea, as well as China. You look at what's happening with the G20, and that is a strategic, political, and economic bloc representing two thirds of the world's population. Now, taking on this G20 presidency for, by India is not only a milestone moment, uh, in the course of Indian diplomacy, but also a great opportunity to lead this decade with an effective intersection of technology and, uh, you know, and uh, diplomacy. So cloud, cybersecurity, AI, IoT, blockchain, and more have actually opened up amazing opportunities to build ecosystems that will now accelerate access as well as affordability. Finally, I must also say that India can be really proud of the way it has made use of ESG along with digital, uh, the core of transformation of the country. You know, having pledged to reach net zero now by 2070, the country has made ESG a, an absolute focal point of boardroom discussions and organizations across industries are strengthening their ESG skills and capabilities. Startups will continue to be India's soft power in our decade journey. As the third largest startup hub in the world, 
with more than 25,000 tech startups, India will enable inclusion of technologies and create solutions for you know, global impact. Among the latest successes is that of an Indian startup called Skyroot Aerospace, which launched the first privately built rocket into space in November 22. And India is also emerging as a global hub for digital talent with more than 5 million in the tech workforce and many more in other sectors. Now this makes India the second largest hub for digital talent with one out of three employees already digitally skilled. The digital tech startup you know, talent pool is now 1.6 million growing at a CAGR of 25%. And with over 36% of women employees, the Indian IT industry is one of the largest private sector employers of women with over 1.8 uh, million women in the workforce out of the 5 million. Now, India has quietly shown the world the power of inclusive technology to drive a human-centric uh, you know, decade, as we call it. And as we journey into this momentous decade, we are sure to witness how the combined forces of Indian digital innovation, startup ecosystems, and engineering and R&D will transform lives and businesses across the globe. So that's where I'll end my little talk and look forward to discussions. Thank you, Keshav. Thank you so much for kind of uh, laying that out for us. It's so actually heartening to hear and consistent given that we are sitting at HBS that and we just heard from Dean Datta that two of his keys, key of the school's initiatives under his leadership are around acceleration of digitization, which is what you touched on, and the role of uh, business and global society, which a large part of that is how do we incorporate ESG, climate, and other important societal issues into how business operates. So, it's, so I'd like to really actually build on those two themes uh, since it's consistent with the mission of the school here, as well as what you articulated and very important for India. So let's, let's talk about um, the digitization piece first. What are the opportunities you see um, of, for India to not just build businesses in India, but businesses for the world? Like, is this an opportunity that traditionally India has been done stuff or big global, net, big local market, et cetera, but what are the opportunities you see for some of our audience members as to building businesses maybe based in India, but for global, like WNS does, for example? Yeah, that's an excellent question and, and, and something uh, that, you know, I think all of us are trying very hard to do. As you know, that over the years, you know, we have, you know, traditionally powered uh, global corporations in terms of enabling, you know, technology for them. And uh, while we built a $227 billion business of which almost 75 or 80% or, or is uh, export oriented, a lot of it was essentially around uh, uh, you know, exporting our talent and then the value add getting delivered in a different country. And I think the challenge that the government and this prime minister has you know, thrown at the, uh, you know, at the uh, CEO community over the past uh, few years is, you know, how can you uh, create you know, a similar kind of uh, ecosystem, similar kind of uh, an opportunity you know, for India, uh, for the world as well? So first and foremost, I think that you know, if you look at essentially the, the, the building blocks, I think India has invested in and created all the right uh, investments and practices and built momentum in terms of some of the things that will, you know, which will enable this. The first and foremost is the fact that you know, we have this outstanding talent which is available you know, uh, for us to leverage, that is one. The second is, as we all know, our mathematical and English prowess that we are all you know, so proud of. So that continues to be you know, extremely strong. But at the same time, I think what India has done extremely well over the past few years, and you know, which you know, comes from you know, companies working closely with the government as well as industry bodies like NASCOM and a few others, which is constantly upskilling, retraining, reskilling uh, talent such that people who are locked in lower level kind of uh, tech roles are consistently being retrained and moving towards you know, higher technology areas. 
At the same time, if you look at the investments India has been making in terms of the new technology areas, I mean, let's face it, I mean, there is a deficit of talent in all of these areas across the globe. And if there's you know, one country which can provide this talent and also do you know, some value addition, it's going to be India. So if you look at the kind of effort that India has made in terms of you know, uh, upskilling, reskilling, and you know, creating this new talent base, it's, I think, one of the most exciting opportunities for the future. If you look at the technologies itself, I think the big opportunity is going to be around you know, artificial intelligence and intelligent you know, automation and you know, how some of these areas will power businesses of the future as well. At the same time, there's also a lot of discussion around things like you know, metaverse. And I think that's another area where I think India will take the lead through its, uh, you know, its talent base. So if you look at it, I think the potential for India to take the lead in interlinking a more expansive you know, kind of digital universe is there. Uh, you know, AR hardware and software will become an integral part of th this world. So I think India has an opportunity there. Blockchain is going to you know, take off at some stage. And again, India has a potential because we are you know, creating the practices behind. NFTs, you know, will, you know, uh, will uh, securely transfer, you know, digital assets from one party to the other. Again, India has the potential to invest and, you know, create leadership there. And we can go on with, you know, decentralized finance, uh, metaverse-based uh, metaverse banks, uh, and, and many other things. But if you look at the most interesting thing India has done in the past decade, uh, Vikram, is we have created 3,000 deep tech startups, right? And I think these startups, which are in various stages of development at this point in time, you know, have the potential to completely transform the way the world looks at India long-term. So from my perspective, you know, I think I'm a, I'm a big bull in terms of, you know, how India will, you know, transform, uh, you know, the world. But I think the potential of all of this, uh, as well as, India leveraging some of the things that it did in the digital stack and taking that across the world. Very simple thing, you know, utilities like DigiLocker, utilities like uh, Arugya Setu, the UDI program, all of these actually have potential to be taken to other countries and, you know, build, you know, a monetization engine on top. And I think the government is starting to do that. So interesting days ahead. That's fantastic. Yeah. So that's India's role potentially. And then maybe coming back to your other comments, which is about the role of digitization technology in inclusive development. So to throw a couple of thoughts out there and get your reaction to it, one is, you know, while India's obviously made significant progress in dealing with poverty, it's still by far the poorest country in the world, number one. Two is, if I look at any data and stats out there, basically the number of jobs that need to be created in India, say roughly about 10 million a year, uh, are more than, sorry, 10 billion a year, are more than you know, the next 10 countries combined, right? Second. Third is, while India has talked about a lot in terms of its progress in technology, and you highlighted the reskilling as well as you know, the, the amount of a number of people hired in the tech industry, Again, based on the data, I've seen that all the jobs combined that the tech industry is probably, you know, about 20 billion or so totally. So in a country that's got 1.4 billion and growing with massive poverty issues and huge job creation, what role should technology and can technology play in solving that fundamental societal problem? Yeah, that's a fantastic uh, uh, question. And I think uh, it's a question that every politician across the world is trying to you know, uh, address. Let me give you my, uh, you, you know, my response to what I think uh, is the you know, art of the possible here. So I think the first thing that must happen from an India perspective is already happening, as we can see. The first thing is, you know, in order to create jobs, there has to be a massive uh, spend or growth taking place in terms of, you know, just infrastructure outlays. And if you just, you know, each time you visit India, I'm sure you're seeing, you know, the kind of uh, work that is being done in terms of creating, you know, new airports, new sta uh, railway stations, new roads, new highways, new ports. You know, I think that's the first thing that needs to get done in terms of creating uh, you know, economic uplift and, and you know, some element of job uh, creation 
for people who may not have the technology skills to participate in the technology side of the business. I think that's the, the first thing that's happening. And just this, uh, just this morning, I, I saw that the Prime Minister of India had uh, inaugurated the new uh, Mumbai, uh, New Delhi, you know, kind of expressway. And I think, you know, you can just imagine what kind of effort must have gone into creating that particular road as well as the other, you know, kind of uh, infrastructure that is being created across the length and breadth of India. And I think that is the first initiative that needs to be done, if you ask me, uh, to, to create this. The second, I think, will have to be around our, uh, you know, creating, understanding our roles as business people and, uh, you know, and, and creating businesses, you know, with, uh, with a soul, I would say. So the first thing is, you know, to recognize the fact that, you know, one of the reasons people come to India from a technology point of view also is the fact that, you know, while we can enable digital transformation at scale for other countries, uh, over a period of time, as the systems and processes settle down in India and some of these things get accepted in India, we can do the same in India as well. So I think the ability for us uh, to really, you know, be seen as companies with a soul to create employment, uh, to, to, you know, take on board the fact that the reason we run companies is also to feed people and while also creating, you know, all the wonderful things of, you know, top line growth, profitability, cash flow, and things like that is a very important requirement, I think, for CEOs based out of India driving, you know, some of these initiatives. And I think the potential for driving inclusive growth is you know really working closely with the government and coming up with new programs that will enable infrastructure outreach you know across uh, the you know length and breadth of the country enable new programs around healthcare to be taken across the length and breadth of the country because you can see that there are many areas that are disconnected you know from a healthcare point of view and there is potential leveraging technology and strong domain for private sector players to come in and, and create that. And I think the government is going out of its way to create that enabling uh, infrastructure to you know, allow some of this. At the same time, if you look at the way India is positioning fiber across the length and breadth of the country, you know, the ability for you know, small businesses to be created in the smallest of villages, smallest of towns, uh, to, you know, to really sort out day-to-day -day issues that uh, you know, people have, and then creating some kind of a revenue model around it is very much there. So I would say that you know, it's, a, it's a journey that has to be, uh, you know, has to be uh, undertaken, but I think the potential for us to do that and, and you know, slowly but surely uh, increase the per capita income of the country is, is very much there. Absolutely, I mean, I think the per capita income has grown and again, uh, you know, based on all the data out there that it's at about twenty three to twenty four hundred dollars per GDP, GDP per capita, which is if you look at historically for most countries is really a takeoff inflection point, which is, I guess, what drives Jeff Bezos and others uh, talking about India being that this being the kind of India's decade century or decade or however, whatever the time frame is. Absolutely. Um, you talked about a very interesting thing about the soul of a company. We talk about the soul of a corporation, the purpose of a corporation a lot here at HPS. So what is the soul of WNS? And how are you thinking about like what you as an organization are doing for all the things that you identified just now in your last comment? Yeah, thanks Vikram for that question. So first and foremost, I'll say that, you know, uh, being the CEO of a public list, publicly listed company, I think it is critical for my team and I to deliver the outcomes that are expected by you know uh, you know all our stakeholders you know first of all definitely our investors so, so everyone is looking for you know that revenue you know, growth uh, so from our point of view our focus is leading the industry in terms of revenues in terms of profitability in terms of cash flow flow as well as in terms of you know just building that leadership quotient uh, inside the company. And I think as a company, we have done that extremely well, you know, over the past uh, number of years. And I think one of the things that we like, you know, as, as a company to focus on is to enable, uh, you know, every other stakeholder involved with the company also to benefit, you know, while our journey is making that progress. Now, when I use that term, you know, a company with a soul, I sincerely believe in it because, I mean, you look at it in this day and age, 
uh, you know, where uh, technology is being seen as the great enabler across the world, right? We are also having this other issue of the technology companies today making announcements of huge numbers of job losses. On the one hand, you know, the US markets continue to do well. You, you're seeing that, you know, the, uh, uh, the hiring you know, cycle continues to be you know, very strong. But at the same time, the, the enigma here is that some of the largest technology companies with billions of dollars on their balance sheet uh, have actually announced job losses. And that has created a lot of discomfort, disharmony, as well as I would say, uh, uneasiness in the minds of employees, as well as potential employees of uh, tech companies uh, in India. And I can tell you, that's the one thing that I'll be extremely focused on as a company. My leadership team is very focused on this, that we will grow, but not at all costs. You know, when, when the pandemic broke out, when, you know, clients were not able to predict, predict volumes to us and we, we lost volumes dramatically, Vikram, one of the decisions we made as a leadership team was to say that we will ensure that every one of our people working across the globe are taken care of, are paid salaries, even if all of us as a leadership team, as well as you know, our, you know, everyone else had to make you know sacrifices. So we made some you know significant sacrifices, you know, across the whole company. But we made sure that not a single person you know, lost their job. You know, every morning when I go to work, I see myself as a CEO of a company that needs to you know uh, feed two hundred thousand people. That's my sixty thousand employees multiplied by by four you know members per family. And as long as we you know, keep that in mind, I think the ability for us uh, to actually uh, you know, create a, or navigate a path which, you know, which, is, uh, you know, which, which allows you to deliver the outcomes that investors need, but at the same time also get you the respect from investors as a company that you know, goes well beyond is very much there. And I can tell you, if you look at what WNS Cares Foundation does, you know, one of the reasons we created it was because we said that as the company makes progress, as the company grows, you know, we operate from 13 or 14 countries, 60, 70, you know, delivery centers. We said we want to make sure that everyone outside of the company, you know, looking at us should also feel that they're part of our growth story. And that is exactly what WNS Cares Foundation has achieved. It creates, you know, real life education programs for communities around our campuses. And, you know, I would say, therefore, every time we grow, uh, we think it's because of, you know, obviously great execution, but also because of the blessings we receive from all of these people. And I think it's very important for leadership teams to think in this way, particularly in a day and age where technology is threatening to eat someone's lunch. Sounds like based on what you just said that WNS would make a very interesting case study for some of the courses out here. Um, you know, we actually teach a course, as was mentioned, and I'm one of the faculty members that does this on leadership and corporate accountability. And, you know, the key aspect of that really is how do you balance the responsibility of companies such as WNS to your shareholders versus your employee, not versus, but how do you balance between shareholders, employees, customers, and the kind of communities that you operate in? Absolutely. It's kind of very interesting you say that. And the challenges, which I'm sure you have, balancing those two, uh, yes. those four. Um, in, in terms of, I mean, this is a student conference. Um, in terms of advice for students, given that, like you just said, that, you know, we're going through some very interesting times in the world. Um, you know, how would, what advice would you give students as they kind of graduate here in the next year or so, and, or if some of the more younger professionals here, in terms of how they should be viewing their career and what they can be doing to kind of, as we say here, be leaders that can make a difference in the world? Yeah, Vikram. So, you know, that, that's, again, an excellent question. And I'm pretty certain you and I, when we meet offline, we can have long discussions on, on this one aspect. But I would say that, you know, just adaptive, you know, adapting uh, through lifelong kind of learning would be the core message that I would want to give, you know, any student. I mean, look at it. Look at me. I'm a, I'm a chartered accountant like you, but I run a tech company, right? So the reality is, I think all of us, have to constantly keep learning new skills, new technologies, new ways of working, and new kinds of jobs, and sometimes you know even going to new careers. You know, so you got to keep that hunger in the pit of your uh, stomach, and you have to keep you know uh, recreating uh, yourself. I would say, 
And in terms of a model, I would, you know, I would, uh, I knew, use a framework, Vikram. I call it the start, stop, and the accelerate, you know, kind of framework. And it, you know, for a young student, quite often it is, you know, what should I start doing? What should I stop doing? And, you know, what is it that I should accelerate yeah, in terms of, you know, my knowledge, my skills, whatever. And so I would say in terms of starting, the, the first thing I would say is, you know, you, I think it's important that everyone has an effective, you know, game plan for skills as well as uh, capability you know, development. So I would say you should keep multi-skilling, you know, yourselves and pick two or three skills for not just in time proficiency, but more for just in case, you know, versatility, you know, so just be versatile about, you know, the, all of this. Uh, you know, you must start developing, you know, out of the box thinking, I would say, in terms of what one must stop, I would say, you know, stop waiting for that green light uh, in order to plan for your future, you know, just imagine yourself in a new, you know, future and, you know, just keep, you know, going with that. So, you know, don't think there's going to be a green light when you will, you know, move ahead. So stop thinking of it in that way. And then the other thing is, you know, stop thinking that only technical skills are more important than behavioral skills. You know, for quite a while, we have spoken about STEM skills and now we're speaking about STEAM skills. But the reality of life is, you know, when you look back, uh, you know, there are tens and of thousands of engineers who have been laid off recently, but I'm pretty certain that people who had that basic uh, degree, but, you know, also had a very strong uh, capability to communicate, taking initiative, solving problems and things like that, I think that is what companies really want in people. So I would say that's an area to you know really focus on. And in terms of accelerating, it should be uh, you know the agility to constantly reflect, reboot, and uh, you know uh, oneself because you know you have to keep destroying what you had in the past and creating a new you know personality of yourself. So learning pace and curiosity you know must keep on increasing in terms of length and. Uh, uh, breadth, I would say, in terms of, you know, understanding new markets, new practices, new things that are happening, you know, around. And the most important thing a young person should tell themselves is that they are unique, have great belief in, in themselves. And, you know, we've all been through this, uh, Vikram, many times. We've seen, you know, business cycles go up and down. But I think the, the people who I think followed some of these practices probably got ahead is what I think. I mean, I got ahead by doing this. That's fantastic. That's, that's great advice. And I'm going to come back to at the end here on Kesha of the person. Uh, but before that, maybe we have a few questions uh, from the group or the audience, if you would like to ask. Sure. The role it can play. Can you use a mic, please? I can if I have one. <laughs> uh, you've talked about the role technology can play. Um, my question would be because if I rank, if you rank the top ten design thinkers in the world, I expect India might have one, two people on that list. If you rank the top ten technology thinkers in the world, maybe two, three. Um, what is the thing that India uniquely has as an area of expertise that the rest of the world doesn't have that could actually, and I, and I would suggest that India is about to demonstrate this capability if they reach any of their goals, any of the 500 gigawatt goals, any of the other goals, they're gonna to have to do something that they're better at than anybody in the world. And they're now gonna to have to do it 10X anything they've ever done before. Right. So Kesha, what is, India, what, is, what is unique about India? What is, what is the differentiating key unique factor? I think the most important differentiating factor uh, of India is its talent. You know, it's talent in technology, it's talent in the, you know, the, in, in the life sciences, liberal arts, and the fact that India has now woken up uh, to the potential that it has, right? You, now, in some of the areas that you spoke about, you know, you must expect that each country will have its own uh, 
you know, it's its own ability to do certain things. And I think from an India point of view, the fact that it has this kind of a talent, you know, 1.4 billion people, it has this huge number of people coming out, you know, uh, uh, with graduation degrees every year. It has, you know, this huge success, you know, uh, available already from a technology point of view. And it's new hunger to start looking at creating deep tech assets and creating, you know, new businesses as well as new startup, uh, you know, thinking is, I think, the biggest, you know, potential for India. So you'll have to sit and watch the space because it is that talent base and that hunger in the people that has now been awakened and soon will be unleashed. Yeah, it's the demographic dividend as to whether it's, it's yeah. channeled in the positive way, as you say, or potentially can be a source of concern, right? So I think that's where, yes, you had a question. Um, hi, uh, I'm Ayush, a first year student at Harvard Business School. Uh, I wanted to touch more on the discussion we were having on technology's role to solve to solving problems like poverty. I come from the state of Bihar, which we all know it has very high poverty rates. And I wanted to touch on, can technology or startups build sustainable, profitable businesses to solve some of these issues of such states, especially when the income of a household is, say, a monthly income of less than ten to 12,000 a month? Yeah, so, so uh, Ayush, first of all, congratulations, you know, for being at Harvard, uh, you know, business school. That's a really a fantastic achievement. And and, and now to ask this question to try and alleviate the problems of the state of Bihar is, is an amazing thing. First thing I'll say is that, you know, poverty can be alleviated and can be dealt with, not with just, you know, one, one facet of technology alone, but actually all of us coming together and doing many things, right? Technology is one aspect of all of it and technology can definitely help in terms of at least creating you know, new jobs for people who at least have the basic skills to perform. So if you look at it, you look at some of the, you know, uh, the areas that companies like us uh, have uh, created our uh, delivery centers and they are in the tier two, tier three locations where we are looking to actually bring in people with a very basic educational degree to actually help uh, some of the leading brands across the world in terms of their digital transformation. But if you look at what you asked for, I think it comes from many other things. It comes from the basics of education itself, which, uh, which, frankly speaking, is also the responsibility of the government. You know, one we elect, uh, you know, people to government because we want them also to do, uh, you know, some things. So I think I would say, education is critical. Not just providing it, but actually people going and you know uh, getting that education. That's one. The second is, you know, having that hunger to want to do something and alleviate, you know, poverty or getting out of that, you know, poverty situation. And then th thereafter, building these kind of skills that I spoke about earlier are some of the ways of, you know, doing this. And I think, you know, as the economy grows, uh, every state of India is going to benefit because, you know, you know, ultimately it is going to be around public spend in, you know, many of these areas that we already spoke about earlier, you know, building roads, airports, you know, ports, this, that, and the other, uh, you know, healthcare facilities. And in all of these areas, if you think of it, uh, technology will play a role. I mean, what is stopping, uh, you know, a, a bunch of people coming together and creating a technology solution that will, you know, enable primary healthcare to every, you know, uh, villager uh, in the state of Bihar, say, and I'm sure the government will enable uh, a monetization model around it. So it, the government already has, you know, digital kind of assets available, but there is a lot of grunt work involved thereafter, right? To actually take that and deliver it. But there is a potential for monetizing that. If you look at, you know, uh, fiber that is now going into every uh, gram panchayat stage today, the ability for the telcos to come in with, you know, maybe smart people like you or people that you know to actually leverage that, uh, you know, fiber, that has gone to the gram panchayat and create a new business process center or a customer service center, you know, in your village or you know in some small village, uh, to work with companies like WNS and therefore you know create jobs and things like that. It's eminently possible. So I would say that these are the ways that things can get done. The most important thing I can tell you is that the opportunity to start delivering on some of this is very high today. Right, it's going to be very difficult to do some of this stuff, but you know the opportunity to do it in India is very high, 
and people who have the willpower, who have the guts, and a little bit of you know funding, which is always possible for a good initiative, can get it done. All right. Sorry, we are running a little bit over time here, but maybe take one more question and then we'll conclude. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, we are talking of clean energy all the time, and recently there was a news that China is thinking of not really giving out the polysilicon technology and the wafers which are required for any kind of clean energy. Now, in that given scenario, if India is to go really solar from renewable energy, then we will have to make our own polysilicon ingot, which means quality power, which currently is actually difficult in India. Would you feel that the solution could be slightly very uh, revolutionary? Maybe you put up some large uh, reliable power, coal, fossil fuel based power plants, and then put, put a polysilicon and gradually you phase out. So we'll do some harm, but eventually we will be able to take uh, care of, have our own uh, solar manufacturing complexes. Yeah, great question. Sounds like a very smart question. I can tell you, I'm no expert on, you know, solar power, but all I can tell you is when you talk to the government in India, when you talk to any state chief minister, one of the biggest areas of focus and potential spend is the whole, you know, uh, clean energy and solar area, right? I'm pretty certain that India will figure it out. And I'm pretty certain that as far as this area is concerned, India is looking at actually creating solutions uh, without China. Yeah. So with that, let us, uh, let's conclude by getting to know Keshav, the person in one minute, which is obviously very hard to do, but we'll try. We'll give it our best shot. Uh, ultimately, we can talk about companies and what they do and all that. It's all driven by leadership. And so we'd love to learn about Keshav, the person. So what 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 fires you up every day, Keshav? Well, in our business, Not it's... Short uh, brief uh, answers. It's, fire, rapid uh, yeah, fire questions. In my business, it's just learning something new in the tech field. What keeps you up at night? What keeps me up at night? All my employees quitting to say, set up a startup. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite IPL team? IPL Chennai. <laughs> Not a surprise, uh, huh? <laughs> um, what is the one exciting skill of the future? Exciting skill of the future will be Jugad. There you go. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> what is one of your biggest regrets? Well, not playing cricket uh, for the country. <laughs> and lastly, mile long inch deep or inch long mile deep? Which one are you? Great question. I, I like to be mile long mile deep. I think the Ooh. potential is there. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. With that, thank you so much, Kesha, for being with us. You've been extremely wonderful. Um, thank you, Vikram. Thank you all for your attention. So I have a fabulous job for helping us set the day on both digitization, on India's growth and your personal story. So thank you very much for being with us and enjoy the rest of your evening in India. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Professor Gandhi and Keshav.